Welcome to Supply Chain Now, the voice of global supply chain. Supply Chain Now focuses on the best in the business for our worldwide audience, the people, the technologies, the best practices, and today's critical issues, the challenges and opportunities. Stay tuned to hear from those making global business happen right here on Supply Chain Now. Hey, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you may be. Scott Luton, Greg White with you here on Supply Chain Now. Welcome to today's show. Greg, how you doing today? I'm, I'm doing very well. <laughs> Having a little fun while we get started here. Yeah, I'm, I'm doing well. <laughs> that is good. That is good. We've had a lot of fun. We, we've had a we've had a fast and furious, but fun, uh, and and based on feedback, very popular uh, close to the year. We got a great episode here today. You as excited as I am? I am, and I, I just got to say, Scott, I think people that don't watch this just listen to it. They kind of miss a little bit of something interesting here. So true. I Which agree. quarter zip we're wearing? <laughs> you know, <laughs> rabbit ears, things like that. Oh, all the good stuff. Well, yeah. hey, you're, but you're right. Our uh, smiling great, faces. <laughs> great episode to listen in, and especially of you. Uh, this conversation today, we're talking with a business leader that has developed quite the reputation for using technology to transform supply chain performance. In particular, Greg, we're going to be taking a deep dive into some of the trends, challenges, and leadership priorities mm -hmm. emerging right now and ahead in the food and beverage industry. One of my favorites for sure. So, Greg, you ready to dive right on in? I am. I love talking to fellow founders, especially ones who are still feeling the joys and the pains of founding and running <laughs> startups. Well, this this promises to be a great one indeed, along with some of those elements there. But hey, let me introduce our featured guest today, Greg. Uh, our guest brings a ton of leadership and practitioner experience to the table, especially when it comes to ERP, supply chain management, imagine that, and quality in process mm -hmm. industries. In 2008, he leveraged all of this success to found Trace Gains, which he leads as CEO today. Now, this award-winning company is on a mission to revolutionize <laughs> supply chain agility, especially across the consumer packaged goods world, CPG. And with all that said, let's welcome in Gary Nowacki, CEO and founder of Trace Gains. Gary, how Thank you doing? Thank you. I'm doing well. Thank you, Scott. Thank you, Greg. Great to be here with you folks today. Yeah, likewise. Good to have you. So, Gary, we want to start. We got a lot to get to here today, but we want to start. Greg and I have a thousand questions on the front end. Like, actually, Greg's got a leg up as usual on me, but I'll get to that in a second. But we understand you spend a lot of time in the summer in Maine, which is a beautiful state. And so, what's when you make the, those yearly uh, trips up up to the Northeast? What's one of your favorite places to visit or eat or just spend time in? Yeah, you, you know, uh, many, many years ago, prior to Trace Gains, my wife and I bought a small cottage on an island in Maine. We lived on the East Coast at the time, so it wasn't that hard to get up there frequently. But then we founded Trace Gains. We're a Colorado-based company. We ended up moving here, could not spend as much time. And then kind of the silver lining of COVID is at Trace Gains, once COVID hit and we were all working from home for a while, we decided everybody could work from home forever. And so we kind of had the COVID diaspora within Trace Gains. We used to be, everybody was in Colorado. Now we have employees in 27 states uh, and four countries. And uh, so now it's awesome. easy. We all go where we want to go. So yeah, my wife and I said, hey, you know, if everybody's working from home, let's just spend the whole gall darn summer at that island in Maine. And so, you know, we like we like boating up there, going to the national parks, uh, you know, and uh, Acadia National Park is a gorgeous place and uh, mm -hmm. doing doing lots of things like that. Oh, I love it. All right, Greg, I know you've been to Maine like you've been everywhere else in the world. What's uh, what's one cool thing from your visits up in that neck of the woods, Greg? Well, you can't get that from here, but um, <laughs> lobster, of yeah. course, lobster. What else? You know, it's such a beautiful state. Um, I mean, there's just so many things to do. I have a buddy who's he drags his RV up there from Delaware or, or something like that, somewhere in that area um, and spends the whole summer up there. And it's beautiful. They have this cliff overlooking the ocean. I mean, it is just it's a beautiful spot. 
Mm. So I, I don't know what, how you pin it down to a single thing. It, it is just an amazing state. All of it. Barely the, barely the states. I mean, very <laughs> might as well almost be Canada, <laughs> right? So well, far up there. Well, so the, the, the island little, we're on is that actually uh, has the, the largest lobster port in America, and they bring in, to that one tiny little island, they bring in about $70 million a year in lobster landings. There are hundreds of lobster boats. And uh, if, if you have time to not edit it out or edit it out, I'll tell you a quick lobster story. The, um, um, we, when we're on the island, we eat a lot of lobster and we eat soft shell lobster. They're also called shedders. You can only get those when you're in Maine. And the reason, you know, lobster, like a lot of these crustaceans, they molt as they grow. They have to cast off their shell, make a new shell. And right after molting, their shells are very soft. They're very vulnerable to predators and they cannot be shipped and survive a trip elsewhere outside of Maine. So if you're in Maine, hmm. you got to have shedders or soft shell lobsters. You can only get them there. Okay. That is a great heads up. Isn't it? I'm starving now. Thank you. Uh, I'm, I'm gonna, you guys keep talking. I'm going to make plans <laughs> for the summer. Well, let's, so speaking of. So I, I don't know if you do this thing I'm about to share up in Maine or, or everywhere else, but uh, uh, this notion of hella skiing, based on our, our homework we've done, uh, Gary, you are very passionate about this activity. Greg, I think, already knows what it is. I don't. Tell us what hella skiing is, Gary. <laughs> well, we're in Colorado, and you can't swing a cat out here without hitting, you know, advanced and expert skiers. And... Um, you know, when you get to a certain level beyond beginner and intermediate, what you start to crave is powder on the ski slopes. Uh, but you can only get it, you know, right after a storm and then it gets tracked up pretty quickly. And as we say in Colorado, there are no friends on a powder day because your friend texts you and says, I'll meet you in 10 minutes. You're like, no, I got to I got to hit the powder. Forget it. See you later. So um, <laughs> what hella skiing really is about is uh, only skiing in powder because you go to one of these places, they have them in Colorado, throughout Canada. You go to one of these places, you jump on a helicopter with other guests that takes you to the top of the mountain. You ski down with a guide in a group, small group together, and it's all powder. And so for, you know, uh, for more advanced skiers, it's, it's kind of Mecca uh, doing that. So, and I don't do it every year. There's, a, you know, I have a little guilt. It's, you know, carbon footprint. So, uh, and it's not cheap. So, it's, it's kind of a special occasion every once in a while for me and I think for a lot of other hella skiers. But if you've got skiers listening and they've never tried it, I can't recommend it enough. Okay, man, a special treat. Greg, have you ever done it? Nope, don't have the guts because what Gary is understating is how steep the faces are that you go down if, when you're hella skiing. I mean, they are, you are way up there. And they basically drop you on the top of a mountain and you ski off the top of a mountain. And wow. especially these days, you have to be up high and the faces that you ski down are those faces you see on YouTube where people fall and then slide thousands of feet wow. down. So, nope. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So next time, Gary, we get together, you're going to have to send some pictures or videos. It is amazing wow. to hear you all describe it. Well, you, you know, we love to humanize people by learning what they're about. As, and as we said before the show, this superhumanizes Gary. I mean, yeah. it's hard to overstate how expert of a skier you have to be to do what he's talking about. Just wow. YouTube it and you will you, just be careful. Okay. You, <laughs> you might hurt your heart. So, yeah. so maybe then what you're saying, the rest of our conversation, which is already pretty challenging and complex when it comes to, you know, supply chain management, that might be a piece of cake based uh, when compared to Hellas I don't know. Hellas uh, is definitely a good uh, precursor for okay. it. Okay. Yeah. Well, let's, I'm going to go with it then. I'm going to go with it. I'm going to use that as a segue because uh, Gary, as we got to understand some of your background a little better, uh, really came to appreciate your journey and how you leverage a lot of your background into um, you know, not only founding uh, Trace Gains, but helping a lot of different companies. So I want to I want to go backwards as we start really getting to the, the meat of our conversation here. Um, you know, prior to serving as CEO and prior to founding Trace Gains, give us a role or two 
that really shaped how you view global supply chain and technology? Yeah, um, I was uh, in the software business for quite a few years before we we founded Trace Gains, and particularly much of my experience was with ERP, Enterprise Resource Planning, software companies. And you know, for people who don't know ERP, they certainly know Oracle or SAP or Microsoft Dynamics or JD Edwards or what have you. And um, so I got a lot of great experience, and I worked with a lot of food and CPG companies in that space. And um, when we founded Trace Gains, we kind of scratched our heads and said, where's a niche? Where, where is there a problem that's not being served? And what we realized is that ERP and most business software really does a great job on focusing on tracking things and managing things within the four walls of your organization. But outside the four walls across these supply chains, the solutions are not as robust and the complexity and challenges really are big. Now, I mean, there's some good exceptions. Uh, I mean, you can get some great supply chain tools to figure out freight, uh, reduce your cost, improve your speed, pick out a carrier and so on. But in the food industry, what we realized is that it's a vast supply chain and all of these companies require a ton of data on all sorts of things, safety related things, quality related things, product development things, innovation things. And they weren't getting that data. They were getting that data through phone calls, emails, running around at trade shows. Nobody was servicing the need to move data across the supply chain. And that was really our founding mission with Trace Gains. Mm. Uh, Greg, respond to that, that, you know, moving data all across uh, the ecosystem, which we're going to talk about uh, more in a moment. And then we're going to find, get some more context around what Trace Gains does in a second. Yeah, well, I think one, one thing that's important to point out is that when you're dealing with food, perishability is a big, big issue. And so the timely movement of data and knowing things like what is the shelf life of a particular product is really, really important. Um, because if you overbuy, if you overbuy bar stools, eventually someone is going to need them. If you overbuy lettuce, eventually it's rotten, <laughs> right? So there's, a, there's a, and, and margins are very, very tight in the food industries with where, especially where perishables are, are included. So there's really no margin for error. And I mean, in some cases, literally, particularly for distributors, no margin for error. So it's really important that the data not only be robust and available, but easily, um, easily managed and moved so that it can be used in very prompt fashion. That, that is really, really important to understand about the food industry. Everything yeah. moves fast and has to move fast. And it's, the margins are very, very tight. Yeah, just to, build, just to build on what Greg said, there was some breaking news this morning. There's been a story going around for a bit, but it developed and broke more this morning, uh, applesauce contamination. There's several brands of these applesauce, organic applesauce pouches that lots of parents buy, trying to be good parents, all natural applesauce, organic. Uh, and it, uh, it's been contaminated with lead. And there's been 200 children in the United States poisoned with uh, lead contamination from the applesauce. What, and this has been going on for about a month. But what broke this morning is mm -hmm. the deputy commissioner for the FDA said it was the cinnamon in the applesauce that was intentionally adulterated with lead. And, you know, why would wow. somebody do that? Uh, pure profit, pure greed, because if you can take cinnamon, which is obviously a very light spice, just throw some lead in there, doubles the weight, doubles your profit. Uh, and so just one example of why critical, uh, how critical it is to move this information across the supply chain. And, you know, our, our, one of our products picked this up and warned people some time ago about uh, lead adulteration in cinnamon. So uh, this is where, you know, we also try to serve the public good at Trace Gains. Well, and, and that's a perfect segue because wow. it's remarkable, isn't it? Uh, you just started to talk about one of your products and what it did and how it got the, the news out and valuable information and actionable information out well ahead of this uh, terrible 
um, a news story. Tell us in a nutshell, what else, uh, for context for our listeners, what else does Trace Gaines do, Gary? Yeah, well, the, those, the food supply chain is the world's largest. So just to give you some quick statistics, it's $10 trillion in annual GDP. So it's, it's 12% of global GDP. Mm-hmm. 40% of global jobs are tied to the food industry agriculture and processing and so on and so forth. So it's a massive, massive uh, industry. Now, on the flip side, it, it causes 80% of tropical deforestation and it causes one third of global greenhouse emissions. So issues like ESG, environment, uh, social governance are critical uh, in the food industry. It's not only the largest by those measures I just gave you, but it's also the most fragmented. Now, what is what does that mean? Well, just in the United States, there are 35,000 sites where companies manufacture and process food, just in the United States. And they're all scrambling to get data from their suppliers about cinnamon and applesauce and everything, and you know, a zillion other items. And um, what we do is we've built a network so that companies connect one time, similar to a social network like Facebook or LinkedIn, companies connect one time with each other and then the information just flows. You know, we're all old enough to remember 20 years ago uh, when we had a fantastic vacation, we took some pictures, we would email them out to 10 or 20 or 30 friends. Some of those friends said, thanks, but I really didn't need to see those. Others said, you know, you forgot about me, you left me off your list. Would we do that? No, we just throw it on social media. We we would post it once. Yeah. And that's what Trace Gains does. We allow these suppliers to connect with their customers once, post all this information, whether it's safety documents or what have you, once, and it automatically propagates out on the network. And my co-founder and I actually have a, a patent on this. We call it Post Once. Okay. Well, one other thing I was going to ask you about, and Greg, uh, I'll tell you what, before I go into this networked ingredients marketplace, uh, Gary, Greg, comment on what Gary, what Gary was just talking about. Just, I mean, the sheer scope of, you know, the global food industry, but also some of the, uh, the specific complexities that multiplied times the scope, man, we have a lot to manage, huh? Yeah. And it's incredibly important. I mean, lead is a, is does permanent damage to small children. So it, that's an incredibly important issue, right? They cannot recover if they're exposed to too much lead at too young of an age. So um, it's important to get in front of these kind of things, um, which, you know, just, I think accentuates what we were talking about earlier and, um, you know, just obviates the importance of, of the ability to connect the way Gary's talking about. Um, <clears throat> so that companies learn about this quickly, can communicate on it rapidly and completely and and figure out what the next solution is. It's funny, we were just talking to somebody else today and all of this data and all this communication is great as long as you know the purpose for which it, it is used, right? And I think um, understanding this as a safety issue or understanding the perishability of products or whatever is so important and again not only impactful to the bottom and top lines of these companies but also to the health of humankind so that that really puts you know an exclamation point at the end of the sentence yes um critical critical to uh be able to to have this sort of ecosystem communicative device excellent point and you're not overstating it either um, all right, so Gary, I want to. You, you mentioned, uh, I think, uh, was it Post One? Was the previous uh, one of the products mm-hmm. y'all offered? I want to ask you about Networked Ingredients Marketplace. Tell us, in a nutshell, what is that? Well, it you know we've been in business. It'll be 16 years next month, and so in the early days, back to Greg's comment about sleepless nights as an entrepreneur. In the early days, you know we had this vision, and we told customers join this network. Uh, and they said, why should I? How many of my suppliers are on it? And we said, not many, but trust us, someday they'll all be there. And supply, we said to suppliers, join the network. And they had the same thing. How many of my customers, right? Um, 
So we finally, you know, pulled ourselves up by our bootstraps, finally hit an inflection point and more and more started to join. And so today, over 25,000 supplier corporations are on this network. We call it Gather now. And um, they represent 70,000 locations because a lot of them do business in more than one site and globally. And collectively, they've uploaded over half a million ingredients and items on this network. And so now buyers can log on to Gather and they can just search for whatever they want. Now, they could be developing a new product and maybe they're maybe they make sweet bars and now they want to make savory snack bars and they've never bought garlic before and so you know they can type in garlic and they can say i want it within 200 miles of my facility to reduce uh, freight costs and i want it to be organic and i want it to be crushed etc so they can log onto this marketplace and filter down across these half a million plus ingredients and last year we took a, a pretty uh, bold move. We just said, let's make this thing free. So anybody can set up a free account. You just go to Trace Gains, just Google Trace Gains Gather. It'll take you there. You can set up a free account. And so now we've kind of democratized buying and selling because you don't have to be a Trace Gains customer like Nestle or Coca-Cola to use this anymore. You can be, you know, you could be a startup in your kitchen with a new brand idea and you can have a free gather account and find these ingredient suppliers. Likewise, we've democratized it for suppliers because you don't have to be Cargill or ADM or one of these massive suppliers only, although they're certainly on gather, but you can be a tiny startup supplier. You can be a supplier in, you know, Paraguay of a certain spice and you can have your product now with a storefront on gather. So it's helped connect people mm -hmm. in, you know, it's a little corny, but that's why we call it Gather. I, I love it. And, and Greg, one of the things I'm hearing, I think Gary is sharing, is it creates also creates uh, not only Intel sharing and gathering opportunities, but it creates business opportunities is what I'm hearing. Greg, your thoughts about Gather? Yeah, I think, um, I think it's a great ecosystem, right? Because the other thing that can happen, by the way, is people can know who the good and the bad actors are. And I imagine that whoever has done this awful thing with lead um, will be virtually, practically, really blackballed um, as a potential supplier in the future, right? Mm -hmm. So, I mean, you can, you can identify who the good and bad actors are in your ecosystem rapidly. Mm -hmm. Right, uh, excellent point. Um, well. We're, we're going to shift over to some other things going on in the industry, but, but great Gary, again, congrats to your team, 25, over 25,000 supplier entities, over 500,000 ingredients all in this gather platform. And folks, we, you know, we love free resources around here and I love that democratization. I said it. Wow. Democratization element at play. Mm -hmm. So uh, Gary, congrats to our audience. Y'all check that out. Um, okay. Moving broad, a little more broadly here. Uh, beyond the trace gain story. I want to talk more, obviously, all of your experience and your team's expertise and experience in the food and beverage industry, amongst others. But let's let's dial it in on F&B uh, for a second. What, Gary, when you think of challenges and priorities that you're seeing leaders face with in this particular industry, uh, what comes to your mind? Well, um, Greg touched a little bit on this. If you're a food company, you're squeezed from two different directions. First of all, your margins are very low. Secondly, rightfully, it's a highly regulated industry where we have FDA, USDA, et cetera, and there are similar bodies in Europe and other places making sure, you know, our food is safe and et cetera, et cetera. Um, but there is burden that goes with those regulations. And when you're low margin and you're burdened with all these regulations, we have something in this country called Food Safety Modernization Act, which was passed in 2011. Uh, and it really upped the game to say, as a food company, you've got to have all this data on file. You can't just say, well, it's not our fault that we bought cinnamon and it had lead in it, right? You're held accountable as the manufacturer or brand owner. So uh, it is a lot for these companies to deal with. And so 
I'd say that's one of the biggest challenges is how do I balance the fact that my margins are low? I cannot hire an army to manage all this regulatory and safety and quality data. Help. And so, you know, we're, we are there in part to help and say, don't worry, we already have a network and most of the data you need is already there. Just join the network and grab the data. Yeah, excellent. Uh, so, Greg, uh, as, as if it's not tough enough to grapple with, with challenging margins and low margins, but then comes all the regulation that Gary is talking about. Your thoughts there, Greg? Yeah, what better application for technology? I mean, the very first startup I worked for was not anything this um, esoteric, but it, but it dealt with optimization of inventories and the complicated environment in which companies operated. And of course, food and food service were two of the industries that um, we dominated because margins are tight, the product moves fast, you have to be in stock, right? So um, it's a great environment when those things come together, tight margins and a very complicated environment because that's what technology is good at. Right. Plug in the rules and let a, let a computer figure that out instantaneously rather than someone, a human being, have, having to do it iteratively. Yes. Uh, and also maybe the computers can help me define the word uh, esoteric. That was a good one, Greg. Uh, that, that's a 50 cent word. I hope there. that was an appropriate use of the word. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, Gary, we're going to keep on diving in uh, to some more industry, industry topics and trends and challenges. I want to talk about innovation for a second. <laughs> Um, you know, one of the silver linings, if you, when we look back at the last few challenging years, and we like talking about it because, uh, you know, we love to focus on some of the better aspects of, of how the last few years are, are making industry stronger, right? And hopefully we learn from these mistakes. So when it comes to innovation, what are you seeing in supply chain? What are you and your team seeing, Gary? We, we have a very large customer base, and we survey them on a lot of topics. And a couple of years ago, we said, hey, how long does it take you when you have a brand new idea? For innovation, how long does it take you from ideation to when you get it on the grocery store shelves? And the range that came back really surprised us. What our customers said is six to 18 months. And I found that pretty shocking. Six so, to eight? Six to what 18 was that in months. That range? Yeah, on the low end, six months to get a new product to market, on the high end, a year and a half. And so yeah. we drilled into that and said, why is that? You know, you're you're already in the snack bar business. You make sweet snack bars. Now you want to make savory, high protein um, snack bars. Why would it take you so long? So we drilled into it. We found out part of the problem is when people uh, went into a new area, they had to find new ingredients and new suppliers. And that took them a lot of time. Um, and a lot of it came down to their personal Rolodex of contacts and their knowledge of years in the food industry, but that's not an efficient way to go. Or they'd go to one of these massive trade shows and walk miles of aisles, uh, or they'd Google and they'd get back, you know, 100,000 pages, including, you know, grandma's recipe for garlic pasta sauce, right? Um, so, so that's why we created this marketplace. So the marketplace alone, we're finding, can save one to two months, shave one to two months off that six to 18 month range. But then there's more. Now that you've found a supplier, you have to properly vet them and qualify them to make sure, you know, they're an honorable company and they're meeting safety requirements, et cetera, et cetera. That can take a month or more because now your quality team's got to get involved. Purchasing's got to get involved um, and so on. So um, and then when you finally qualify them, you start formulating and building a recipe, which you can now build in trace gains. And. But that can be an onerous process because you've got to fat finger in a massive amount of data for this new recipe. And uh, so we accelerate that also by just bringing this data in through the Gather Network. So um, innovation is too slow. And of course, it's a C-suite problem because executives, CEOs and other executives are under pressure at these food companies to grab the next trend, get on it fast. Right get shelf space in the grocery store and six to 18 months is too long. Okay, Greg, that makes so much sense to me on so many different levels. 
your thoughts as, as uh, Greg, as Gary kind of laid that out and how we can continue to shave off time from that six to 18 month uh, cycle. Yeah. Immediately when that, those numbers came out, I was like, still, I cannot believe it still takes that long one. And two, um, that the consumer is very fickle and the life cycle of a new product might be six to 18 months. Mm. Right. I mean, if you think about the beverage industry and you think about where we are with, um, uh, you know, these like white claws and things like that, it wasn't that long ago that they were all the rage and they're already fading and the next thing is coming around. So when you think about these kind of innovations and when, when Gary says trend, my hackles come up and because I think that is very, very hard to chase and you have to do it unbelievably rapidly. Um, you know, I mean, we, I, I was mostly when I was in retail, I was mostly in the merch, the, the, um, sporting goods and the automotive space. And even there you have trends, right? I mean, you have fuzzy dice or whatever it is, right? <laughs> and there's a very, very short window for some of those ridiculous, stupid, but very prof- profitable things. Um, so uh, yeah, it's stunning that that, that still happens. Um, but it, I mean, it's good that there is technology out there that can shorten that. So Gary, can you give us an idea? I mean, if if someone has uh, you know, has the capability to do that. How tight can that window be rather than six to 18 months? But let me, I'll answer that question, Greg, but first I just want to uh, uh, build on what you just said. McKinsey actually did a study about five years ago. They surveyed food companies, consumer packaged good companies, and they said um, over five years, if you go back in time and look at all your new product launches over five years, Five years later, how many of them are still on store shelves? One out of four lasted five years. So you're exactly right, Greg. You got to jump on these trends very quickly. Um, But to answer your question, we we think we can shave between two and four months off the cycle time. So, you know, instead of six to 18 months, maybe it's, you know, three to 14 months or something like that. That is impressive. Um, and and by the way, Greg, fuzzy dice that that dominated the landscape back in the '80s, and I think that's the first time we've mentioned that in I don't know some 1,300 uh, podcast episodes. Well, that, Everything, I mean, yeah, probably two thirds of our audience won't even know what that is. <laughs> that's right? so true. It's so true. Um, all right, uh, Gary, going back to um, uh, that McKinsey data, and and of course going back to kind of where we started with with innovation and especially new product development. I love how practical. Uh, that you, you know, have the practical outcomes that you and the team are driving uh, mm-hmm. that two to four months out of that cycle, that, that is, that is massive and beyond all the costs associated um, mm-hmm. being able to Greg and your point of getting out to the market as fast as possible. That is so critical um, when it comes to innovation before, uh, before we move into this ecosystem uh, question, because we've been, we, I think we've dropped ecosystem seven times already in the first half of this episode Anything else, Gary, when it comes to innovation or new product development that you really want to uh, share with our audience here that you're, you're seeing out in the F&B industry? Yeah, I think um, I think in general, I talk to a lot of folks uh, through my own podcast, which is focused on food and CPG innovation. And I think there are fads and there are trends. So, I, I, you know, for example, keto, I think many people in the industry would say keto is a bit of a fad, not a long term trend. Um, now, uh, replacing yeah, fluid be. milk trend, not a fad. Um, you can see every year lower and lower volumes of fluid milk are, are, are being consumed here in the United States. It's being repl- replaced by the plant based milk, right? Oat almond, soy, et cetera. Uh, and those things are for real and they're not, uh, they're not a fad. They, they're, those are long-term secular trends. Um, so, and I could go on with other examples, but uh, it's what makes this industry fun and kudos to these food companies for innovating because, you know, they're picking up on consumer demand and consumer needs. Yeah. Well said, Gary. And, and kudos to the lead leadership out there, Greg, that are finding the right partners to help them innovate successfully and quickly to take advantage of the opportunities out in the marketplace, right? 
Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you have to turn to technology to do that. You know, we've been talking about digitization or digitalization or digital transformation, whatever you want to call it, for it seems like a decade now. And, you know, the truth is, and we've talked about this in many shows, so I'm going to say it again, because this is the absolute fact. We have a we have a talent shortage in supply chain, and we will continue to have a talent shortage. As I've said before, we will never, ever again have enough truck drivers, right? Never, ever again. So you can quote me on that. Actually, you probably could have quoted me a hundred times before this on that. Um, you know, the dark, dirty, dull, and dangerous jobs in warehouses and manufacturing facilities and things like that, those um, will be automated. And, and some of these jobs where computers are just better to do it, I think planning jobs will be heavily augmented by automation. And a lot of what Gary's talking about, compliance-based jobs and, and profit-oriented jobs, oriented jobs, and, you know, tough um, optimizations, those combinatorial analytics that I know you love to hear me say, those combinatorial analytics problems that are so complex. And the fact that supply chain is truly an ecosystem, not a chain at all, right? Because there are so many interdependencies there, just like an actual ecosystem. If you want to see a good representation of a supply chain, just watch... Um, Oh my gosh, now I forgot the movie. What's that? The movie with all the blue people in it. I was going to say Spider-Man. Because webs? No. Is that where you're going? Uh, no, no, no. I'm thinking no. of, uh, never mind. It doesn't matter. <laughs> <laughs> um, where, you know, where you can plug into your, your dragon and, and fly him. I cannot remember what that movie Avatar. Thank you, Kristen. Thank you. <laughs> yes, if you want to see a representation of an ecosystem, Avatar is perfect for that. And that is exactly what a supply chain is because everything is interdependent on everything else. Gorton's fish depends on one Indonesian fisherman, right? To go out there and they, and he depends on his Yamaha engine to start every morning and whatever. So, I mean, it, it is very, very complex and very, very intricate. Well, Greg, you're reading my mind because that's where we're going next with Gary, right? Uh, I think we're up to the account of uh, 12 mentions already of Ecosystem and Avatar for the first time. What a great movie. Uh, all right, but Gary, um, you know, we've heard and used the word ecosystem so much more, it seems like, in recent years, you know, especially in, in, in global supply chain, you know, suppliers, manufacturers, customers, brands, all of them in this world, right? So two, two part question, Gary. First, why is this mindset approach, uh, this phraseology important? And secondly, what do you see as a couple of things that these ecosystems have to have to thrive? Mm. There's actually a whole branch of economics that studies this. Um, and there's a, a phrase that's commonly used is the network effect, the network effect. And so uh, the basis of this theory is that the more people or companies who use a network, the more valuable that network becomes. Therefore, more people or companies want to join it. It becomes more valuable. And this right. whole thing spins up into a flywheel. If you think of the very first network, it was the phone system. And you can actually go back and see old black and white photos on municipal streets of thousands of wires going down the street because in the very first version of telephones, it was point to point. It was not a network. Why do I use that analogy? Because still today in the food supply chain, too many companies are relying on an analogy like that. They do business point to point yep. instead of going through a centralized switchboard. And so there are many software implementations that have happened uh, over the last 10, 20, 30 years that are, you know, yes, they're technology. Yes, they're software, but they're point to point. Some people call it a hub and spoke model. I'm a big company. I'm going to have all my suppliers come in and feed me my data. And then they're going to have to do it again and again and again with all their other customers. And back to point, uh, Greg's point on digitization, that's a bad example of digitization and why you can apply digital technology and it ends up making things worse. We've talked to ingredient suppliers who've said, our customers are driving us nuts. I have to log on to a hundred different portals 
just like the very first phone systems, that's insane. And so we are stopping the insanity by building this network and not a hub and spoke or one-to-one pipe model. So when we hear about ecosystems and network, we always say, wait a second, is it a true network or is it a pretend network or a very bad first generation implementation of a network? So, um, Greg, stop the insanity. I love what Gary's, Gary and his team on that mission to stop the insanity. Comment there because you really talked about the importance of it all. And then I'm going to circle back to Gary and get a couple of important things these ecos- ecosystems need to thrive. Your comments first, though, Greg. Uh, first of all, preach it, brother. Yes. Um, <laughs> a, a proprietary network is what a lot of companies call it. And it, it's not it's not a network at all because it becomes unscalable at some point, right? Because let's just take the example, just pick any restaurant chain, right? They know who their primary vendor is. It's usually some distributor, right? Who has a hundred or a thousand brands that they offer to this, this company, but they don't know who the vendors are to those brands. And they don't know who the vendors are to the vendors of those brands. And that's become a very real problem. It's something that the government is actually addressing with the scope three and scope four um, ESG, ESG initiatives around emissions. Um, and now it's becoming government mandated around the world because of things like, like uh, emissions and human slavery and product provenance, what we talked about at the very top of the show. And, um, and that's because there are these issues like, lead in in cinnamon and there are these issues with human slavery being used to produce or or child labor being used to produce certain products and of course there are always the emissions in some cases many cases excessive in producing certain products so companies are now becoming legally accountable for knowing who their entire ecosystem is and just that first tier of suppliers is not sufficient excellent point Greg. Okay, Gary, uh, feel free to comment on what Greg just shared there, critical thoughts, or, and, or, the power of the and, and, or, Greg. Um, there you go. You know, briefly, a couple of, a couple of things that these ecosystems have to have to thrive. Your thoughts, Gary? Um, well, you've got to have critical mass, right? It's not going to do you any good if you buy from 500 ingredient suppliers and two of them are on a network. Um, and, um, you know, we frequently today when we're talking to a new company, uh, they, they ask us the tough question. Well, how many of my suppliers are on your network? And we say, do you want to find out? Let's sign a mutual NDA because you're going to give us your confidential list of suppliers. So we promise that won't go anywhere and we'll check. And, you know, typically these days we're getting in the range of 85 to 90 percent. So the size and participation of a network is is really everything. And, um, you know, uh, we can either, you know, I really want to build on Greg's ESG comments. Um, we can either do that now, or I know you may also want to ask me what's next for Trace Gains because ESG is a big part of what's next for us. Yes, Gary. Uh, well, why don't we go ahead? Well, first off, let's build on Greg's point there. And then we got, I got a couple of questions we'll wrap with Gary, including that one. Okay. Sounds good. So tell, tell us more about, uh, ESG. Yeah. Your thoughts there. Yeah, so it, it actually ties into your question about why networks matter as, as, as well, Scott, because, <clears throat> you know, if, if I'm dealing with hundreds of suppliers and I want to start analyzing the carbon footprint of my end product, that snack bar, and it's got 20 ingredients, where do I even start, right? And let alone uh, slave labor and all sorts of other issues that are part of ESG. So we are rolling out uh, very shortly, uh, starting in early 2024, a three-tier approach to ESG. At the first tier, companies can use trace gains to start to dive into their ESG uh, profile um, on a basic level, fed by the data we've already collected from their suppliers. Then they can take it to a second tier where through partnerships, we have scientific analysis of all of thousands of ingredients. So for example, uh, the carbon footprint of 
you know, conventional corn grown in Iowa may be different from the carbon footprint of organic corn grown in Florida. Um, however, uh, you got to factor transportation in because that adds to carbon footprint as well. So we've got a data partnership now that we're launching where people can bring in profiles, detailed profiles on every ingredient uh, to, to really get serious and deep on this. And then the third most advanced level is what we would call N-tier ESG, which is I'm not just worrying about my first tier suppliers, but I need to take this data and drive it N-tier down to their suppliers and their suppliers' suppliers. This, why does this matter? Uh, tropical deforestation, right? Um, you know, I'm not, I'm not going to Malaysia to get my palm oil, but somebody is. And are they cutting down mm -hmm. forests over there and killing the orangutans, right? And so this end tier is something that some companies are also going to be interested in. So ESG right now, we believe it's the Wild West. Uh, everybody wants to do something about it, but the solutions are scattered. The data is incredibly difficult to get your hands on. The whole area is incredibly difficult to figure out. Europe leads right now. They've already passed some regulations. In the United States, mm -hmm. we are lagging behind from a regulatory standpoint. But I think most companies realize the day is going to come where we're going to have ESG regulations in the United States, just like we have food protection legislation here. So we're, 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 we're going to try to tame the Wild West of ESG and bring these uh, multi uh, different kinds of ESG solutions to everybody. Gary, that's exciting. Uh, and two quick comments. And then Greg, Greg I'm going to get your reaction. Uh, Greg, Gary is referring to a lot of the opaqueness, which is another phrase we used earlier today. It's out there in that landscape, kind of what you're referring to with the suppliers of your suppliers of your suppliers. And mm -hmm. that end tier, especially that, that, that third tier end tier where you can really see into that with data and confidence. Greg, it sounds pretty powerful to me, but you get your thoughts to uh, uh, what Gary is rolling, he and the team are rolling out there. Yeah, well, it's, it's extremely powerful. It is now compelled. And soon what the U.S. does, I would argue that now for any company that does business internationally, it doesn't matter what the U.S. US regulations and policies are. Because if you do business in Germany, um, you have to comply with their non-slavery laws and their, their ESG laws. And some of those goods are not made in or specifically for Germany. So, I mean, I, I have already talked to, as you know, Scott, we talk to all kinds of practitioners all the time who have to be concerned in every plant because every plant's products could wind up in Germany, right? So, um, or in Europe somewhere, or, you know, in, in Asia where regulations are also very tight, ironically. Ironically, the goods coming into Asia are, highly regulated in Indonesia and, and as in Malaysia, as Gary talked about, they are deforesting, um, you know, at a high rate to produce palm oil. So, um, you know, there, there are some incredible ironies. None of that really matters. The truth is it doesn't even matter anymore what the United States position is and how long we delay it. The, the implementation of this scope three or any derivation thereof, because scope three really only deals with emissions. There are already regulations well beyond emissions regarding provenance and regarding human rights that we're way behind on, but companies have to comply with that anyway. So what the U.S. does will just be a reflection of things like GDPR. I think GDPR is a great example. The reason that we have the right to privacy is because of the GDPR regulations in the EU and how they structured that to be universally applicable to anyone from the EU in any part of the world has the right to the privacy of their, their own personal data. Likewise, they believe in Europe, and I think rightfully so, that anyone has the right to um, limit emissions and, of course, limit eliminate, hopefully, human rights violations in the production and transportation and delivery and consumption of goods. Yeah. It, it'd be along those lines, Greg, great point. Can, yeah, sorry, can I, just, can I just add on to something Greg said? Because with emissions, uh, there was an important sure. study done. I forget who did it, but 
what they did is they mapped out all these different supply chains, you know, utilities, steel producers, electronics, food. And, you know, if you're a utility or a steel producer, a lot of your CO2 emissions come from your plant and your facility, maybe 80, 90 percent. But if you're a food producer, it was all the way on the other end of the spectrum. A food manufacturer, only about 20 percent of their CO2 emissions come from them. 80 percent of it comes from the end tier supply chain. So one more reason mm -hmm. end tier and ESG is so critical for the food and CPG industry. Well, uh, Gary, this, that's exciting. And I can't wait to, uh, as you roll, you and the team at Trace Gains roll that product out. Uh, that really is going to be so, I think, uh, so powerful and timely and incredibly relevant. We look forward to having you back and getting an update on what you're learning. Um, all right. So, and you know what? I was going to ask you what's next for organization. We couldn't wait to talk about it. So, so we moved it up in the conversation. I want to ask you this. So this Together Conference. Now, um, that uh, is a big event coming up. Uh, and I want you to tell us, if you would, what's important about the event, of course. But more importantly, perhaps, this community that your company has been investing in and building and serving. You know, why is that so important to you and the team? Yeah, we do this uh, conference uh, annually. And, uh, you know, we'll get several thousand folks attending this conference in January. We call it together. We do it for free, partly as a, a public service. Uh, so there are a lot of speakers at the conference speaking on generalized topics for the food industry, food safety, food safety culture, all sorts of things like that. But we also tend to use it as a platform for big announcements. So everything I just talked about in ESG, we will drill down into that in the January Together conference with lots more details. We will also have some major announcements on AI because we're doing quite a bit now with artificial intelligence. Artificial intelligence works best with massive amounts of data. And what could be better <laughs> than this network with over half a million ingredients, over 25,000 suppliers, et cetera, et cetera. So we are applying AI. We have already started to ship AI solutions to our customers. And we're going to roll out lots and lots more AI going forward. Again, because food companies run on tight margins, they want solutions inexpensively and powerfully. Uh, and so that's that's what we're in business to do. So, and we're also going to be making a major, major announcement that is top secret. So uh, we're, we're going to be making a, a big announcement to it, our Together conference. Can we get clear? Yeah. <laughs> Well, hey, um, uh, speaking of AI, I'm glad you brought that up. Uh, going back to an earlier point, Greg, you were making, uh, you know, there's there's AI regulatory um, uh, policy getting passed through the EU kind of as we speak. And that'll be really interesting to see once that gets voted into place. To your point, Greg, the ripple effect throughout the rest of the world, including here in the U.S. So we'll see. Um, all right. <clears throat> so I've got an idea for the Together Conference because, Greg, you and Gary have been quite a one-two punch. Here's my thought. See if y'all buy in. Y'all should both have a helicopter take you up to the highest mountain, jump out, ski down on that powder, break into the event venue, and give a one-two dynamic, one-two punch keynote to kick off the Together Conference. Gary and Greg, can we make that happen? If we I can make it. it an I'm electric in. helicopter, I'm, I'm up for in. it. Yeah. <laughs> okay, Gary's yeah. in. Guaranteed. All right, good, good, good. I'll do it. I'll do it. I'm going to need those I'm big, fat, parabolic skis. But There I'll you go. <laughs> I will sit in the front row with popcorn and Diet Coke and watch it happen, okay? All right. So we've talked about what's next. That is so exciting. We've talked about the conference and that powerful community. That's, that sounds like um, you have already you, you know, surpassed that flywheel effect, and there's just so much opportunity there, and you are doing a great, uh, really great service to industry, and there's a lot more good stuff to come. Well, Gary, before we wrap, you are also a fellow podcaster. Gary, I'm not sure how you how you find all the hours in a day. So um, this popular podcast you've been leading, tell us one of your favorite episodes thus far. I, I, I Actually, I'm going to give you two super quick. Uh, one is um, there. Uh, there's a book that was written called um, uh, called uh, Mission in a Bottle. And it was written by the co-founders of Honest Tea, 
a guy named Seth Goldman and a guy named Barry Nailbuff. And Barry was a guest on my podcast. And if you're in food or, you know, an entrepreneur of even any kind, read that book because it takes folks through, as Greg said, all the pain of entrepreneurship, what Seth and Barry had to go through. Uh, And some of the challenges are very much supply chain challenges that they talk about in that book. So, um, you know, that that one was one of my favorites. And the other one was everybody wants to be a billionaire. And uh, so I had the billionaire uh, kombucha guy on my podcast. His name is GT Dave. And he uh, he was one of the found he was the founder of one of the earliest kombucha companies. And he is a billionaire. And he made it out of kombucha. So it's it's just a hoot listening to his story. Uh, and uh, and, you know, he would say, yeah, you know, I did well, but I also did good. So uh, so that's a good one to, to have a listen to. Ooh, Gary, I love that. Greg, he's kind of talking our language there with doing well, but more importantly, doing good. Greg, you respond to that. Well, first, what's the name of the show? So folks can plug in if they want to see it. What yeah. do you call your show? <laughs> yeah, thank you for asking. It's uh, uh, C to C, which stands for concept to consumption. So it's all about innovation, concept okay. to consumption. So you just type in C to C, C T O C for short. Uh, you know, Stitcher, Apple, whatever, wherever you get your podcast. Awesome, awesome. I hope some folks tune into that. Definitely. Uh, well, I mean, first of all, I love anyone who's getting that kind of message out, and that sounds like a heck of a lot of fun. Um, you know, we, we do a lot of shows where we bring interesting people like Gary. It's kind of cool to have someone who's both a tech entrepreneur and a podcast host at the same time, right? Cause we can both really relate to that. True. Uh, so yeah, that's been, it's been great having you here, Gary. Appreciate it. Love what you're doing. Yes, I do Thank too. You. Uh, so Gary folks check out C2C, uh, which stands again, what does that stand for again, Gary? concept to consumption okay all right there'll be a quiz after today's episode uh but hey really cool c to c check it out wherever you get your podcast from sounds those two episodes you shared sounds like fascinating conversations gary i'm looking forward to checking that out myself um okay uh big thanks Uh, we're about to get greg's patented key takeaway i can't wait to tune into that it's gonna be a good one we've tackled a lot of great stuff here uh, with uh, Gary, but Gary, big thanks to you and the Trace Gaines team. Really have enjoyed the conversations we've had here. Really appreciate how much y'all have grown and, and just how robust um, your wherewithal to be able to stop the insanity that's out there. Seems like you're making big gains there. So how can folks connect, any of our audience out there, how can they connect with you and the Trace Gaines team, Gary? Oh, multiple ways. You can just go to our website, tracegains.com. Uh, and uh, that'll direct you to a free gather account if you'd like to sign up and get a free gather account. Um, You know, we're on LinkedIn. People can uh, directly reach out to me on LinkedIn is a good way to just message me there. Um, And, uh, you know, lots of other ways to get a hold of us. That's right. Maybe in the summer up in Maine and in the skiing time of year, whenever that is, up in the beautiful mountains of uh, Colorado and beyond, perhaps. Um, all right. Big thanks, uh, Gary Nowacki, CEO and founder at Trace Gains. Gary, thanks so much for being here today. Thank you so much, Scott and Greg. Uh, great conversation. Thank you for what you do. I really enjoyed it. Uh, hey, appreciate that, Gary, but don't go anywhere just yet. So, Greg, we have had a, one heck of a conversation, as we knew we were going to have with Gary. Really appreciate what he and the team are doing. A lot of the in, really innovation, how they're changing how business is done, so much for the better. But but what's your, if you had to narrow it down to one thought that folks got to keep front and center from our time here with Gary, what would that be, Greg? I think the recognition that Gary has ignited is, you know, hopefully in a lot of people today is that the supply chain is an ecosystem more than a chain and that that interaction and rapid knowledge sharing is so critical. I literally during this episode texted my daughter and asked her if she knew about that because I have an almost two-year-old granddaughter who needs to know those things, right? Because as I said, the damage of lead is irreparable. So um, so I, I think the that is a great story of how impactful that 
truly innovative, truly communicative and, and truly modern technology, technology solutions can be in the supply chain that they can literally save or change people's lives. You know, we always talk about the impact that supply chain can have on a brand's identity on, you know, as I always say, we do one thing in supply chain. It's very simple. We deliver, right? We deliver product, we deliver profit, and we deliver brand identity and equity to companies that, that on the promises that they make in sales and marketing and that sort of thing. So there is a lot at stake here, but I don't think people think about the fact that lives are often at stake here or that health is at stake here. And I think it's important for people to have that recognition and to realize how important our job is, because not only in the food industry, which is admittedly somewhat laggard because of what Gary described, there is such high risk as their profits are so tight to begin with. There's that danger of doing something wrong and not having enough profit to cover it. Um, so that's why they tend to be a little slower on the adoption side. But the risk is so high to the brand equity and to the long-term profitability of the enterprise that I think what Gary is doing, two, two things. One, the high efficiency and high impact of what he's doing, but also making it so accessible, this free communication device, right? Making it so accessible is critical to getting people over, over the threshold of adopting new technologies and starting to really see the impact that it can have on their business. When you can have that recognition that I dodged a bullet of, of this health scare here for free rather than after it has cost your company hundreds of thousands or millions of dollars, it is also an awakening to realize you've dodged a bullet and you dodged it because of this meaningful and impactful piece of technology. And I should probably engage more with that. So I think it's an important awakening for companies to realize how impactful technology can be without having to get punched in the face first. Well said, Greg, well said. So folks, to that end, be sure to check out uh, the Gather uh, opportunity, a free account as Gary has, has laid out there. You can also learn more at tracegains.com. Check out the Together Conference coming up soon. Who knows who's going to be skiing into that event. <laughs> and connect with Gary, check out the podcast, C to C sounds like some a, a great, uh, fascinating conversations there. So again, uh, big thanks, Gary, uh, Nowacki and uh, CEO and founder at trace gains. Gary, thanks for being here. Thank you, Scott. Thank you, Greg. Really enjoyed it. You yeah, bet, great Greg. Uh, Greg white, always a pleasure. Appreciate you being here as part of this conversation. Uh, and, but, and folks, thanks for tuning in all of our mm -hmm. audience out there. So you know the challenge we're about to lay out there. Uh, you know, Take one thing that Gary or Greg shared here today and act on it, right? Deeds, not words. That's what we're talking about. Your team will appreciate it. Your organization, your industry will appreciate it. Uh, and on that, on that note, with that being said, uh, on behalf of our entire team here at Supply Chain, now Scott Luton challenging you to do good, to give forward, and to be the change. And we'll see you next time right back here on Supply Chain Now. Thanks, everybody. Thanks for being a part of our Supply Chain Now community. Check out all of our programming at supplychainnow.com and make sure you subscribe to Supply Chain Now anywhere you listen to podcasts and follow us on Facebook, LinkedIn, Twitter, and Instagram. See you next time on Supply Chain Now.